Well, we are back in the book of Acts with our new series, Thriving Under Pressure. And if you didn't notice that song, I got to ask you that song. Does anyone recognize where that song's from? If, if it's, if it's uh, David Bowie, raise your right hand. If it's Vanilla Ice, yeah, Ice Ice Baby, yeah. That's what I think of because it's a different generation. But, but, but there was a whole legal thing in the, ni- in the late 80s, early 90s between those two, stealing and sampling music. But uh, um, Ice, ice, baby. That's not exactly why we chose that song. But we're coming back to the book of Acts, and there is a shift that takes place. Now, uh, I was super excited we got to use that song because I thought, what better song illustrates where we're going in the book of Acts than under pressure? Because what we've seen in the book of Acts so far has been them settled in Jerusalem the day of Pentecost, the church is born, people in Jerusalem, the name of the Jews in Jerusalem, uh, there's, there's opposition to what's taking place, but the church is also growing. And I said, man, we're going on, we're, you know, something's about to happen. In today's passage, we see a shift of, of, of geographic shift and, and in kind of a reception shift of how people view the church. And I said, could we use the song by David Bowie? And I was, I was half joking but thank God for Pastor Jordan, who's like, listen, David Bowie's dead. We can use his stuff. If he was alive, we wouldn't be able to use that. So ice, ice baby or whatever, it's, we're under pressure. Let me give you just a, a, a little background. I mentioned that we were, we've been in Jerusalem. We've been in the very first part. Of, it's been since November since we've been in Acts. So I, I recognize it's been a while. So let me refresh your memory. You may recall there was a couple times where Peter and 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 Peter was in front of the Sanhedrin, right? There was a number of times where he stood up and he gave sermons. He gave a sermon on the day of Pentecost. He gave a sermon again in, in chapter 4. You remember what happened in chapter 4? In front of the Sanhedrin? They warned him, stop speaking about Jesus. And then chapter 5, he finds himself in front of the Sanhedrin again. Sanhedrin being the, the high ruling council in Jerusalem. Um, he's, he's in front of them again. And they're like, okay, you didn't stop speaking about him. We're going to flog you. That was chapter 5. Now we're in chapter 6, and we see not just a warning and a flogging. It actually takes place in chapter 7. We see the first execution, the first Christian martyr. His name is Stephen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 6. The reason we're here, and when I was talking of, well, turn with me to Acts chapter 6. Listen. I'm going to tell you straight up, I, I want to spoil this sermon series for you. The reason I'm excited about this is because we're going to watch the church and opposition and persecution, actually, rise up against the church. And we're going to, we're going to watch the church grow even further. Numerically, geographically, God's people are scattered at the end of this sermon. And I'm, 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 I don't want to spoil it. They're scattered and the gospel spreads. And I, I think sometimes I hear, and sometimes in my own self, I look at the change in our world, in our culture, and how the church is viewed and received, how it's changed in my lifetime. And I know some of your lifetimes are a little longer than mine. You've seen it change a lot. Like I hear stories about pastors used to be really be respected in the community. I was like, oh, I wonder what that would be like. I should have been a pastor 80 years ago. I'm just a dude in the community now. But we watch the news and we begin to wonder about the future of the church, what's going to happen. The reason I wanted to use that song as their bumper video for this series is I was texting our creative team about the artwork and the music. I said this very thing, and this is kind of to set us up for this next, the next few weeks. I said, there's a sense of dread about the changing culture and the church's future in the church in America. There's a sense of dread. But the church's future is not dependent on ideal conditions. It's dependent on Almighty God. Spoiler alert, you could skip church for the next 11 weeks because that's, that's where we're going. 
The future of the church is not dependent on ideal circumstances. In fact, and we'll talk about it later, most of the church in the world doesn't have ideal circumstances. Now we get to Acts chapter 6. Just as a background, as you, as you turn there, Acts is written by a guy named Luke, an associate of Paul, the only Gentile author in the New Testament, lit, written in the mid-60s, not 1960s, but the mid to late 60s. Probably during fir- Paul's first imprisonment to Rome, records the birth of the church, the spread of the gospel. And it starts off with, and, and you, uh, we showed this every week in, in previous series, in my first book, Theophilus, I told you everything Jesus began to do, and that was the gospel of Luke. And now he's saying, I'm going to tell you what Jesus continues to do, but he's doing it through the church. Now, we left off, and I know it's been months, we left off in Acts chapter 6, the very first half of Acts chapter 6, where there was a, there was tension between the Greek-speaking Jews and the Jew, the Hebrew, the Aramaic-speaking Jews, the, the local Jews, the hometown turf Jewish people, this is not a racial tension, this is a cultural tension, uh, because in Jerusalem there were Jews who, lived from other, who, who came from other parts of the world, born, spoke diff- born, born outside of Jerusalem and other, in other places, spoke Greek rather than the, the local language, and there was tension. In fact, there was this idea that maybe the, the, this was within the church, that the Greek-speaking widows... Jewish background, Christian in the church, were being overlooked or neglected in the daily distribution. We talked about whether that was food or money. That's, you could listen to that sermon from last November. And so they came to the apostles. They asked the apostles, what do we do? The apostles said, hey, listen, we got to pray. We got to give ourselves to the ministry of the word. You guys select some leaders who will serve. And they got together and the church selected seven guys all with Greek names, because Greek names don't happen locally. They, they picked the other side that people didn't represent. It wasn't about being represented. It was about being the right people for the right job. And one of those people was named Stephen. So we pick up his story. So 1 through 7, uh, uh, Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7, is that story from the last message in this series. And then we get to Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 8. Now, check this out. 6, 8 to 8, 4. We're not going to read it all. Much much to my disappointment. It's a, like, chapter 7 is like 60 verses. We'd be here a long time. All right, we're going to read the first part, part, though. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. You may recall when he was selected to serve earlier and actually said that Stephen, a man of the, full of the Spirit. So they persuaded some of the men to lie about Stephen, saying, we heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders and their teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council, the Sanhedrin that we spoke about a little bit ago. The lie witnesses said, this man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel's. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations true? Now we're going to stop there because this is the setup. This is the setting. It's it's the very end of chapter 6. Stephen's about to speak and defend himself and kind of give a sermon, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Let's just talk about what we read. Stephen was one of the Greek-speaking Jews, also known as being a Hellenist, born in another country, uh, did not speak Hebrew or Aramaic. He was involved in a synagogue in Jerusalem. Did you see it? A synagogue of freed slaves. So very likely descendants of slaves or, or the place was uh, established by by, by people who were former slaves. But it seems that this was a, a Greek-speaking synagogue because there are Greek-speaking Jews in Jerusalem at that time. So he's, he's there. Now, I'm so excited for, about this. This is our third mini-series through the book of Acts, and this is the first map I'm going to show you. I haven't shown you a map. In some of the very beginning, I thought, maps are hugely important. Listen, we talk about knowing the Bible. Okay, I'm, that's my thing. I got that map. Okay, 
Just to give you an idea, because we're going to get into maps a whole lot more when we get to Paul. That's later in Acts. But here's Jerusalem and Samaria, Judea. This is that whole region. Remember Acts chapter 1? Uh, remember what Jesus says, you be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And we're going to see that in the book of Acts. But right now, we've only been here. Now, where are some of these other Greek-speaking believers from? Cyrene is over here. Today, it's Libya. Alexandria is over here, Egypt, uh, Asia, and then Cilicia, which is here. And right here is a town named Tarsus. Who's from there? A guy named Saul, who later becomes Paul, a Greek speaker, who we know from later in the book of Acts was born there, but was raised here. He does actually speak Hebrew. He does later in the book of Acts, or Aramaic. But listen, could you imagine? And it doesn't say this directly, but I'm wondering, because Saul shows up, who will become Paul. He shows up at the very end of the story, holding the cloaks of the guys who crucified, or who, crucified who stoned Stephen. Look, look, at this, look at this where it says that none of them, they were debating with Stephen, and none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke including possibly Saul? That'd be quite the thing. Saul was the Jew of Jews, right? He was the Hebrew of Hebrews. He was circ- you know, in, in Philippians 3, he says, hey, I was circumcised. I'm a I'm pure blood citizen in the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee. I obeyed the strictest level of the law. Could you imagine spirit-empowered Stephen trumping Saul? It doesn't say Saul was necessarily there in the debate, but Saul was there in the story. And Saul, a Greek-speaking Jew in a Greek-speaking synagogue in Jerusalem. Just just a thought. Verses 10 through through 12, we see this debate. We see people can't hang with them. So instead of winning the debate, they decide we're going to come up with some false accusations. We're going to get people to lie about what he's saying, that he blasphemed Moses and and, and God and, and that... Um, it's interesting, though, that Moses is listed first, kind of like a priority in their mind. You blaspheme Moses, oh, and God too, right? It tells you where the priority is in their mind. In verse 12, he is arrested and brought before the high council, and by the time, from the debate in a the, in the Greek-speaking synagogue, and there's accusations of blasphemy, now he's in front of the Sanhedrin, the high council, and now we have charges of blasphemy. This is the same council that condemned Jesus to death not too much you know, earlier than, than what we're looking at, weeks, right, perhaps. The same council that Peter and John were standing in front of in the book of Acts where they were warned and then flogged. What are the charges that are brought against Stephen? That he speaks against the temple, that he speaks against Moses. Verses 13 through 14 says, this man is always a speaking, speaking against the holy temple, and against the law of Moses. Verse 14, we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs of Moses. Now, do we know this? this we know this when Jesus talks about, you know, tear this down, I'll rebuild it. He's talking about himself and the system that goes with, along with the temple. So did Stephen say something along those lines? Probably, but not exactly what they're making it sound out to be. Stephen is essentially threatening the status quo, changing things by talking about what Jesus has changed through his life, death, and resurrection. Verse 1 of chapter 7 says this, Then the high priest asked Stephen, Are these accusations true? Here's where I think Stephen could have got out of dying, because we know he's going to die. He could have said, nope, (laughs) they're not true. He could have said something, something to preserve himself, but he doesn't. I think that's a picture of the spirit-empowered witness that we've been talking about throughout the book of Acts, and now we are here he stands up and defends himself. Now, he gives a, 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 a sermon. We're not going to read all of Stephen's sermon. So there's two sermons here. This is one of those weird situations in the book of Acts where I'm giving a sermon on a sermon or his defense speech, if you want to call it that. Um, there's a sermon that's specifically 
to this Jewish audience at that time in that place. So he goes way back in their history, starts with Abraham, and begins to talk about, you know, the Jewish history. So we're not, we're not those people. But then there's a sermon based on this whole incident that Jerome's going to give, right? So I'm not going to preach his sermon, although, as we'll see, maybe his sermon does apply to us. Um, Stephen gives a defense giving really a history lesson of, all, for, of Israel's history. It's strange because the people he's giving this defense to are intimately aware with all the stories. He gives three examples. Uh, there's Abraham. He goes way back to the, to the roots. Father Abraham, then to Joseph, and then to Moses. Now, the people he's talking to know these stories inside and out. But the way he tells it, maybe they don't know as well as they think they know. He talks about Abraham. Now remember, Jesus was, was not liked because he was shaking things up. Stephen's talking about this Jesus. The church continues to shake things up. And he says, Abraham shook things up. Abraham was a man of faith. He, was, he, he changed the status quo in obedience to God. He left his country. He left his family. He went to a place he had never seen before. He believed that God would give him descendants there's, there's this contrast between Abraham, who they say they are aligned with, and he's saying, are you really aligned with Abraham? The one who went out and trusted God in this mighty change, and all you're trying to do is hold down the fort of what you're used to? Won't even listen to the idea. I mean, the Messiah came. Okay, that's, that's me adding. They're, they're not like Abraham like they think they are. The church in Jerusalem is acting more like Abraham, launching out into new territory, breaking the status quo, challenging the institution or the establishment. And then we have verses 9 9 through 16 of Acts chapter 7. He begins to talk about Joseph. He gives similar treatment to to, to Joseph as he does it for Abraham. God took Joseph through difficult times. He was rejected by his brothers. That sounds like the church. Sold into slavery placed in the prison, eventually elevated to a place of position so that he could be used by God and God's plan for his people. You think you're aligned with Joseph? Not as much as you think you are. That's what he's saying. Then verses 17 through 43, this is the longest section. He talks about Moses, which is obviously one of the things they accused him of speaking against. And the idea here is God is really the, the hero of Moses' story. You, you put Moses as, as this hero, but he, the, he opens up by saying, don't you remember that Moses was a failure for like the first 80 years of his life? He was a murderer. Then God appears and empowers him, then sends him back, and the people follow him as he went and spoke the words the Lord gave him. But you're elevating him but God's really the hero of Moses' story. When people obey God, they have the power of God behind them, but when they refuse, then they're in trouble. And he's saying, where's your obedience to what God is doing in your day? Then there's verse 37, and he's talking about Moses. Look at this. Moses himself told the people of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me. A prophet like me from among your people, he's saying, Moses himself said that things were going to change, that this wasn't the way it's going to be forever because you and your disobedience, you end up in exile. This is all in his sermon. We're just kind of recapping it. You end up in exile in Babylon for 70 years. Therefore, he had to raise someone up. Someone like him that would usher the people into a new relationship or a new covenant with God. Moses said things would change. And here we have the Sanhedrin and the religious leaders resisting the change that God was bringing with Jesus Christ and the church. Their disobedience brought them into exile. I think perhaps they looked back at their history with such a high idea and favorable uh, picture And Stephen is saying, you know, like throughout the Old Testament, 
our ancestors, your ancestors, that's what he was saying, but it was, they fought against God all throughout the Old Testament. Think about the book of Judges. Think about all the kings of Israel and, and Judah. Like all the kings of Israel were terrible. And the kings of Judah had some good ones, but they were pretty rotten themselves. You're looking back at this old covenant with such great high, like, this was the way it's going, and, and, and you're trying to change that with this Jesus stuff. It's like, let's be honest about the way things were. We've been fighting against God as a people. Brought out of Egypt, then complaining about we we were in slavery. I mean, it's the story of the Old Testament. Then he moves on to the temple, because that was one of the other charges against him. And he says this in verse 48 through 50. After speaking about the temple, it was, it was carried through the wilderness. The tabernacle was carried. Then David asked, hey, can I build a permanent place for you? Then Solomon actually built it. However, the Most High doesn't live in temples made by human hands, as the prophets say. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Could you build me a temple as good as that? Asked the Lord. Could you build me such a resting place that in my hands make both heaven and earth? Now, do you know who this, he's quoting here? The prophet Isaiah. He's saying, if you've got a problem with, 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 with Jesus and talking about the temple and with the church, then your, prof, your, your, your issue is with your prophet Isaiah. God is so much bigger than the temple. God himself says the temple is not adequate for him. Moses said things would change. God said the temple is not adequate. So you're charging me against speaking against both them, but I'm in alignment with them far greater than you are. And then he closes his sermon or his, his defense speech with these words, and I am going to read it, starting in verse 51 of chapter 7. You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors did not persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. You, del you deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. See, Stephen once again is saying, you think you're aligned with Moses and God, but you're not. You're aligned with your ancestors that fought against them, that killed the prophets. See, if, 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 if Stephen was preaching a one-point sermon... It would be something along the lines of God works through those who are willing in obedience to him to challenge the establishment and change the status quo. That would be his one-point sermon, like God is doing a new thing with those who are willing to follow him into the new thing. But that's his sermon for them, who were unwilling to follow what God was doing through the revelation of Jesus. They didn't like his sermon. They didn't like the way he closed <laughs> We pick that up in verse 54. The Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God. And he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then he told them, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. Then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting, they rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul, who we know will later become Paul. Saul, who was a Greek-speaking Jew raised in Jerusalem, who knew his stuff, but didn't like Stephen. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, Receive my spirit. He fell to his knees, shouting, Lord, don't charge them with this sin. Kind of following the, the model of Jesus on the cross. And with that, he died. Saul, once again brought up for a reason, was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem, and all the believers except the apostles were scattered through the region of Judea and Samaria. You see, I can't preach 
Stephen's sermon is mine because that was to a different audience, but to this audience, when we read this, there's a whole other sermon that comes out. When you take this, this closing narrative of Luke on Stephen's death and then you jump just a few verses more to chapter 8, verse 4, but the believers who were scattered preached the good news about Jesus wherever they went. This is a transition point in the book of Acts geographically, but it's, it's, it's more than that. Persecution has now fully set in. We've gone from warning to flogging to execution. Do you remember what Jesus said early on, Acts 1.8? We looked at it almost every week that we read in this book. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses, my martyrs. The word that we get martyr from is that word for witness telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, through Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What we see in chapter 8 is it spreads through Judea and Samaria because they're running for their life. Is this the end of the church? I wish I could finish like one of those like old, old school, like, what will happen to our hero? You know, like one of those things? What? I don't even... Oh no, Stephen's been, you know, has been executed. I don't know that I want to be in on this thing anymore. I don't know that I'm, I'm going to stick around we got to go underground, if anything. Well, they flee because they're not dummies, but the gospel goes with them. And God uses it. Their pain and their loss. And God uses it for his glory and his kingdom. And that's hard for us to reconcile because we don't want our pain and our loss necessarily to be used for God's... I mean, we'll, we'll settle for it if it's after the fact, but going into it, Tertullian, who was a, a church father in the late second century, said this, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. What would be our lesson for today? Because what you see in the book of Acts is further persecution, further opposition, and further growth of the gospel. What you see in early church history, in those early centuries that followed, more persecution more growth of the, of, the, of the gospel and of the kingdom. For those of us who find ourselves nervous as we watch the news, as we talk to people, as we look at the world around us and how it's changed, can I give you a word of comf uh, just to bring some confidence to you? It would be this, that God's going to take care of his church. In fact, if you believe that God created the world out of nothing, out of nothing, an all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing, all-present God created the world out of nothing, then you can be confident that he'll preserve his church through anything. See, I'm afraid sometimes we lament and we fear not the, the, the future of the church, because the future of the church is, is secure. What I think we fear and lament is the loss of our comfort zone, the loss of the familiar things. We live in a, in a very blessed culture, and we're going to talk a little bit about Christians around the world have a very different reality than us. And is our reality changing? Yes. The church is, is secure. I think it's okay to, to, to lament or, or to to recognize the changes that may feel like it's putting a squeeze on us. But we can do that without fear because God's going to take care of his church. The church in America may look different in the future. I'll be honest with you. I don't know. I don't really know. I don't have any other way to feed my family, so it can't be too different. <laughs> Like, if we go underground, I'm going to have to learn some trade or something. Do they pay you for being good at FIFA? On, no, they don't. They don't pay you. They do pay you, actually. Some teenagers make money on video games. Just kidding. Uh, listen, well, could things look different? I don't know. 
But I think about Stephen's sermon to people who were unwilling to be involved in what God was doing in that moment to change the status quo, to roll with God as he rolls with people who are able to roll with him. Maybe that sermon does apply to us. God will take care of his church. So what do we do? First thing I would say is remember that Jesus said it would happen. Jesus said it would happen to these very disciples. Not to Stephen. He wasn't in that room, in the upper room, before Jesus was arrested and put on trial and crucified. But to the apostles, John chapter 15, you may recall when we were there a couple years ago. He's in the upper room and he says this, if, if the world, to his disciples, to the 12, he gives this instruction, but it's also for those who would follow him in all ages. If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of, your own, as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. Do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than a master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. They would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them, but now they have, ex uh, ex they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. If I hadn't done so, so, such miraculous signs among them that no one else could do, they would not be guilty. But as it is, they have, even, they have seen everything I did, yet they still hate me and my father. This fulfills what was written in Scripture. They hated me without cause. Jesus talks about that, and then he says this. It sounds very similar to the very beginning of Acts. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, and you will be my witnesses. That's not the same verse. It's the same thing. You receive power when the spirit comes on you. I will send you my, the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will, he will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. Now listen to this. I have told you these things so that you won't hurt and, and, and experience personal suffering and you could avoid the pain. Is that what Jesus says? No, he says, I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. When this stuff happens, there will not be disillusionment. You'll know Jesus said it. You won't be shocked because you, you don't believe the lie of American Christianity that says if you bless, if you serve God, then he owes you a good life. Ooh, I'm meddling. I believe that lie sometimes, so it's not like I'm calling anyone out here in particular. I've told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. For you will be expelled from the synagogues. The time is coming when those who kill you will think they are doing a holy service for God. Literally what we're reading about right now in the book of Acts. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. Stephen was full of the Spirit and he was a bold witness and he died. We're all like, yeah, full of spirit, full of witness. Here, my Lord, send me. And then he died. Oh, he died. Oh, wasn't necessarily waiting for that. Like the first half of the book was exciting, right? Full of the spirit, bold witness. There's a price. The second thing I would say for us who have it pretty good in America still, even though the world you grew up in is not the same as the world you live in now. We have it pretty good. And if you need a reminder how good we have it, the second thing I would say is to, oh gosh, find time. I'm not saying every day. Find time, do some research, do some study, and pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world who are actually persecuted or persecuted in a greater level. In the 20th century, there have been more than 26 million documented cases of Christian martyrs. 26 million. From AD 33, when Christ was 
crucified. Until 1900, there were 14 million cases. There's almost double in the last, what, 120 years? 65% of Christians martyred since the church began were killed in the 20th century. And we see that continue in this century. Current statistics, I looked it up because I don't know this stuff by heart. 360 million Christians in the world suffer harassment or persecution. One out of every seven Christians worldwide suffers some sort of persecution. If you, if you actually zoom in, that's worldwide. If you zoom in on Asia, it's one out of every five. Or no, if you zoom in on Africa, it's one out of every five. If you zoom in to Asia, which includes India, and you know that part of the world, it's not just, you think of Asia, you always think of just like that coast. But you think of all of Asia, two out of five. Two out of five? 75% of all religiously motivated violence and oppression is suffered by Christians. In North Korea, Christians are considered hostile elements to be eradicated. In Afghanistan, Christianity is not permitted to exist. In Somalia, Christ Christians are high-value targets. Christians in Pakistan live with a constant threat of mob attacks. Christian converts in Sudan are targeted for persecution. In Iran, it's illegal to convert. It's illegal to preach. In India, there's unprecedented violence against Christians. Do some study. Do some, do, do, some, do some homework. There's something to pray about. And just because we have it better doesn't mean we don't have our issues here. Let me, let me give you the third thing. Rely on the Spirit's power. You heard it in John when I was reading it. I will send you the advocate. We've heard it in Acts. You receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. May we rely on the Spirit's power. The, the, the advocate, the parakletos in Greek is translated counselor, helper, comforter, advocate. It's the one who comes alongside kind of a Greek legal term. There is a, a, a Roman term as well that's advocatus, but the same thing. It's someone legally coming aside to help. We need the Spirit's help. While our burdens are indeed lighter than those of our brothers and sisters in other places in the world, our burdens are still burdens nonetheless. We praise the Lord that we are in position to gather in this place and worship together. Praise the Lord that we can go to our workplaces and our schools and we could say, I'm a Christian. I'm not saying it doesn't come without any consequences. <laughs> you may face scoffing or mockery you may be treated differently, passed over for promotion. You may be kind of set off to the side socially. And I think we've acknowledged that all of us feel some sort of squeeze from our culture. We still need the Spirit's power. Maybe you listen to the words of James B. When he, in James 1.19, when he says we need to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to be angry, may God, through his Holy Spirit, let us walk rightly in a world that Jesus said would be against us. I, I'm afraid we spend too much time trying to get the world to like us. Why don't we just represent Christ and trust God? If you're not a Christian, this is probably a weird sermon to go to. Like, oh, I came to church because I don't know why I came to church because someone brought me and they're talking about dying. Like, we're not like lined up trying to be martyrs here. I actually, just the book of Acts, it's the next chapter I had to preach it. But I want you to, I don't want you to misunderstand anything. I want you to, to know that the reason we are gathered in this place is because we believe that we were born separated from God. And the only thing that can make us right and right standing and right relationship with God is Jesus Christ. Part of the Trinity, the Logos is what the book of John says. He takes on flesh. So now he's fully God and fully man, the only one who could actually make things right and, and, and pay the penalty that our sins deserve that 
dies the death in our place on our behalf. And if we put our if we put our trust and our faith in Him, that we can be made right in right standing. And we talked about this over the last few weeks. There is new life in this life and the next. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message that these people are willing to die for. Let me close with this passage, and the band's going to come here in a moment. We're going to sing a song, kind of personal dedication song. This is uh, Peter, who was this, kind of the star of the book of Acts early on. First Peter chapter 4, starting in verse 12, he says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you, you are going through, as if someone something strange were happening to you. Once again, it's like, don't be surprised, don't be, don't be shocked. Instead, be very glad for these trials. And the trials he was speaking about, those were trials. Not taking anything away from us, but that first century church was facing it. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment and it must be begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And so if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to God who created you, for he will never fail you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. What a privilege we have, Lord, to <clears throat> open your word. We see the example of these early Christians who stood boldly in the face of opposition. The Bible doesn't say where Stephen was in this whole thing with the resurrection. We know there were eyewitnesses that Stephen knew. And we know those eyewitnesses would eventually give their lives because they believed in what they saw. But here we have maybe one degree of separation. Someone who with his trust and his faith in you, the resurrected Christ, without maybe seeing but the testimony of those eyewitnesses. They knew what they saw. And this Sunday after Easter, Lord, we remember that you indeed bring new life in this life and the next. A new life doesn't mean a comfortable life. It doesn't mean an easy life. It means a new life lived in you through the power of your spirit. Lord, I pray that we would indeed walk in that newness of life. And that as we go from this place, the world would look at us and see that something's different. And may we indeed be your witnesses right here right now. In Jesus' name, amen.